Well, good morning. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. This is uh, a continuation of our uh, coronavirus and agriculture series from the Farm Doc Daily uh, team. This one entitled Outlook for Farmland Price and Evaluation and the Determinants of Farmland Price uh, with Gary Schnitke and Bruce Sherrick. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. And thanks to Jim Baltz, who is our technical director and behind the wheel. Uh, we appreciate that. Over well, the next half hour, we'll talk a lot about the price of farmland and the values and how it's all determined. And you can ask questions of us as well, write those there uh, in uh, the uh, go-to webinar control panel. We'll take care of those in about half an hour. I think we'll get started right now. Gary Schnitke or Bruce Sherrick, I'm not sure which of the two of you are getting started for the day. Oh. I guess this is what we're starting with, yeah. <laughs> me. So yeah, let's go ahead. We're going to start off with a, um, we're going to go ahead and do a poll question. The values of major stock indices reached pre-COVID levels. What will stock prices be one year from now? So the stock indices have come back up to pre-COVID levels. What do you think stock prices will be? Where will they be a year from now? Substantially lower, lower, about the same, higher, or substantially higher. So go ahead and fill that out. And we'll uh, get the we'll show the answers to these questions as well. So go ahead and uh, uh, fill that out. Oftentimes people like to hear how many folks are here. We're just getting started, so there will be more that come along. But right about now, they're getting close to 150 if you're in attendance, so you'll have an idea of what this looks like. 65% of you have voted at this point. Take a moment, hit that gray box, and uh, fill out. Uh, this quick poll on the value of uh, stock indices. What will they look like a year from now? There's our answer, substantially lower, 7%, lower 26%, 27% about the same, 37% higher and substantially higher, 3%. What'd you think of the answers? Did they uh, come in about where you thought they might, Gary Schnitke? Yeah, the, they did. And actually, we asked this question because the same drivers that are impacting the stock market are also impacting farmland prices. As we did mention here, stock prices were about the same price or are at the same level. Stock indices are at the same level now as they were pre-COVID. And so we'll see what, 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 they, what they do forward. One of the interesting things about that is that about four for technology stocks, Apple, Facebook, uh, Google, or Alphabet, and uh, uh, make up the majority of the stock indices values that, uh, now. We are going to do the same thing, or we're going to look at farmland prices. We're going to talk about current level of cash rents, where we see those things going, then talk about current farm prices, and then talk about the determinants of farmland prices. Our major message today is that we can expect, perhaps expect to see farmland re prices remain stable, and that could happen even if we see cash rents decline. Um, one other note here before we go into the cash rent, next Friday, or not this Friday, but Friday from now, we will do another webinar. This one will be Outlook for Farmland Prices and Rents. Here we'll show you a survey of results of what the farm managers and rural, or rural appraisers in Illinois think that cash rents will look like for 2021, as well as farmland prices. So that will be a look ahead. And now we're going to begin on current levels of cash rent. All right, so if we're looking at current levels of cash rent in Illinois and surrounding states, what we've seen is stable prices. These, uh, these prices, uh, these lines here for Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana are for, from NAS, National Agricultural Statistics Service, and they represent average prices or average cash rents in Illinois, and they go through 2020. In 2020, um, Illinois had an average cash rent of $222 per acre. Iowa had $230, and Indiana had $194. So you can see there what the average cash rent levels were, and those obviously uh, vary across the state. One of the major things about cash rents is that they have been stable since 2016. Came down from highs established in 2014 and then have been stable ever since, 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Um, those, those average cash rents have been in a very narrow band. and 
they have been there that way for obviously since 2016 since prices corn and soybean prices have come off their co or their highs from the ethanol belt so we've seen stable prices those returns have vary across the state this will give you a feel for what those returns or cash rents look like across illinois this is a map from 2019 this map will be updated this friday so nas will again release 20 or yields we will see what they are for this year so uh next webinar 2020 or in, on september 4th we'll provide an updated look at this map i do not expect any changes in average cash rent levels you will we will see some vari variations around these levels but i expect those rents to remain relatively stable you can see here that we have as we always have our highest cash rents in the middle part of the state central illinois with macon county at 296 uh, sagamon county at 290 and there's a um, todd's uh, favorite county of Logan, 286. All of them are in that uh, high $200 an acre range. And we can expect to see those remain relatively stable. Again, we have not seen much movement in, re in recent years that are on cash rents. We do see variability within a uh, county and just to, uh, with, within a county and even within farms right next to one another. Um, tremendous variability in cash rents across farm tracks. To give you a feel for uh, some of that variab variability, uh, this shows uh, what farm managers said were the ex uh, cash rents for excellent quality land for 2019 actual and what they expected for 2020. That will turn out to be r roughly the same. A little bit down for farm managers uh, survey but still close to that $300 value. Excellent quality land would be something above likely 200 bushels per acre. You can see there it rents 302, 298. Good, somewhere in 185 to 200, uh, 175 to 180 for average, and then below that for fair quality land. All of those came down a bit as we were looking at uh, at uh, at those rents for for 2019 and 2020, but um, fairly fairly stable. So we've seen seen those come down a bit, but cash rents have been very 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 sticky. One of the major stories, I guess, about cash rents is is that they have been stable since 2016, but our re agricultural returns have come down. This uh, slide shows what those average cash rents uh, look like compared to operator and land returns. The green bars are operator and land returns uh, going back to 2000, and then we have 2020 and 2021 projected there. Um, those, those returns were high in the, higher than in the 2010, 2011, 2012 period, 2013 a year as well, and then have come down. Since 2014, average cash rents and operator and land returns have been almost equal to each other. Uh, farmland uh, cash rented at these average levels have had um, a slightly positive return in recent years. One item to note is that for 2018, 2019, and 2020, you see the orange little bars there. Um, those orange little bars represent the ad hoc disaster federal uh, payments. Um, so those 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 give those federal ad hoc disaster debt payments, and you as you can see, they are, have been significant for our agricultural returns. 2021, your guess is as good as nine is whether we have those ad hoc disaster assistance payments. If we don't have them we will have negative returns. Again, significant. And as we're moving forward, 335 to 310, uh, we, we can expect prices in this sort of mid $3 soybeans 850 range uh, for the foreseeable future, we need ad hoc disaster assistance. And again, you can see that minus 51, which is where we would be at projecting that return 
if if we don't have ad hoc disaster assistance and yields are trend level. So moving forward, those uh, federal payments have helped considerably in agricultural returns and holding up cash rents. So going forward, we expect low prices for the foreseeable future, 350, 860 is a, is a good level to think about. And we will likely to see uncertainty about whether we have federal aid moving forward so that's the big question mark so again as we're looking forward um, we see these different lease types we've been talking about cash rents and we've seen more people move towards those cash rents um, over time predominant and in, in moving away from share rents one share rent or rental arrangement we want to mention quickly here is a variable cash rent uh, this is something that I always mention. No one does, but we always mention it. If you're concerned about what's happening next year, one of the ways to uh, look at those things is this is variable cash rent. Set a base cash rent and then choose a rent factor. And again, if we're looking at 2021, include those uh, at federal payments in there. And then if we get them, it, then we can share in them. If we don't get them, uh, we have less financial stress on the side of the farmer. So variable cash rents, and these are examples of uh, of of, uh, of items that you could set. You could set it for two hundred dollars per acre as a base rent, and then have rent factors of thirty three and forty percent. So just gives you an example. Look at Farm Doc, and we have a couple of examples of those leases. In any case, where we're at here, and if you would take a poll, uh, cash rents are stable. We'll see what they do next year. Federal payments are where they're at. Let's do a poll here, and we're going to move next into uh, farmland prices, but here's our question. And the reason why we're asking this question is because interest rates are key in where we're going and we would make the argument that even if we do see those cash rents go down we might see uh we might see those uh, farmland prices remain about about the same that slide here does show where we're at this is the 10-year rate and you can see that uh even in 2020 after we thought it couldn't go down any further it did go down further Bruce, they're talking negative interest rates, aren't they? Oh, they're talking all kinds of things. We've had um, uh, kind of complete reversals every time we hear something from open market committee, it seems. But lots of lots of interesting things are going to happen in the next year. But you think they're going to be about the same, 26% higher, 5% lower? I don't know where I come out of that. I might even go lower. It, it's a new world. so. Take her away, Bruce. Thanks, Gary. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just turning a little bit now directly to the farm real estate values and what we think is going to inc influence those going forward. A big one will be interest rates, of course, and you just heard me kind of stammer around that I don't know which way they're going. And it reminds me of a headline that I love from a long time ago that said there are two kinds of economists, one who don't know which way interest rates are going and the other who don't know that they don't know which way interest rates are going. So I think that part's anyone's guess. But let's start with recently released data from USDA. The 2020 farm real estate values and the survey by state, and again, these are broad averages. So, you know, 7,400 would not be an appropriate number for high quality land. 7,400 is not a appropriate number for super bad rough land, but the state actually went up a bit since 2019. 1.6% increase you see. These are not, you know, giant changes. They're not actually very unexpected. But what we've heard from market participants is that the markets have been pretty darn stable. In fact, uh, low run rate, you know, deals are different than they used to be. They seem to be abnormal deals or unique deals, um, but it's tough to scare up volume right now. But across the heart of the Corn Belt, what we see is essentially no change on average, minor changes. California, likewise, important to note, no change. Um, we will show a slide near the very end from another source altogether. Um, National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries, where we can look at what I would call commercial scale, professionally managed investments in agriculture as well. But to 
you know, uh, you know, it's not a cliffhanger. The, the punchline is going to be very similar that farmland has done reasonably well. So what actually impacts farmland prices? Well, a lot of things. And we often uh, have to uh, kind of correct, I guess, public narrative or popular press when somebody will say, well, prices are going down on corn, so farmland values are going to fall. And we say, well, no. Or why aren't they moving more quickly as income has moved for two or three years and we haven't seen much change in farmland values? Well, it actually makes sense. And what are the major influences for the future that will influence uh, the farmland markets? Uh, we hear this a lot and it's a, it's a nice way of describing it, but farmland is what it earns in the same way that an equity would be thought of as being priced based on its earnings and its ability to generate earnings uh, to the future. Farmland is the same thing. What can you earn from owning it? And in farmland, it's a bit more complicated because part of our return might come in the form of enjoying owning it or living there or having um, integrated other activities that are not purely financial. But in general, it's a good, it's a good framework. Uh, farmland is what it can be discounted at or its earnings can be discounted. And so we, we understand that if you have a lower cost of capital, the value of that future income is higher. And if you have a higher cost of capital, then the value of that future income goes the other direction. So we're gonna go through some things that help understand that at a slightly more fundamental level. And then maybe we can ask in, in the face of the big things happening in the future, what do we actually expect? This is a chart that if, if you have heard me or seen any other presentations, I like to include because I think it's incredibly informative and it has information for from and for lots of different perspectives, but the, the vertical axis is just the yield on treasuries. CMT means constant maturity treasuries. The front right axis is for term to maturity. So one month, three months, six months, all the way out to 30 years. And then at any point, the timeline, which goes from 02 to last Friday, uh, at the end of the week, we just plot the term structure. And what you see is September 19, 2008, we all remember, or most of us remember when the short-term markets essentially shut down and were pegged at zero and we had long period of government intervention. I'm going to make some obvious parallels here. We had a long period of government intervention where we changed the capitalization rules. We changed what we thought would happen to manage productivity. The, the slope and the level of the yield curve is something that's very uh, important as an indicator of the uh, production gains in the economy. And then when we got kind of out of that, uh, we thought we were coming out of the financial crisis. We began normalizing and we had a series of rate hikes and then a series of rate cuts. And a couple of those were even what we would call emergency or not during open market committee meetings or planned cuts. So that's where we are. That's where we be, that's how we got to how where we are now. And so we're going to look at a few just snippets that show how to think about what the cap rate might be or the discount rate might be for agricultural farmland investments, agricultural investments in farmland. Uh, this slide I like because it's just the yield curve as some constant snapshots. The um, solid lines are the first week of each year from 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And what we see, of course, is... Um, 16, we had kind of the purple normal curve, thought we were getting back, 17, improving even more, 18, getting a little flatter, so some concern about the distant. Um, and then 20, we began to fall and then we just collapsed. So all of the dotted lines have happened within this year. We have uh, all experienced what happened in the equity markets, you know, from March to April to May and so on. But take a look at the, the vertical line at 10 year and just kind of register that as we uh, begin to make our comments going forward. And this is again, a slightly different version of, of the same information that was shown during the poll to say, if we just plotted this, if we just looked at it every day, what would it do? And in the middle of the uh, housing crisis, we kind of said, ah, oh, maybe we've established a new normal and we have a two and a half to 3% 10 year rate. Surely that's as low as it could ever go because with reference to history, you know, the great gambler's fallacy, it's never been this low before. Surely it can't stay that low. Well, we were wrong. It can't stay that low. It went a lot lower. Um, and we're now, you know, sub one and no real strong prospects for getting back above sub one. Um, and 
let's think about this in a slightly different way, same information, but just the last three years where we look at the one-year rate, the 10-year rate, and the 30-year rate. And while it's a little bit of a complicated idea, think of that as the credit spread index. So the longer the investment, how much more do you have to pay than if it were a shorter investment? And this is really important to understand for agriculture because when we started to see the treasury markets decline and we saw cost of funds, if you will, as an index for you know, risk-free activity uh, go down, you might have noticed your lending rates didn't go down by as much as treasury rates went down. So you know, if I had a variable rate mortgage, I was a little angry that I didn't get to see all that reduction in the uh, bank's cost of funds, in some sense, translate directly to lower payments. And in agriculture, we didn't get the complete translation of lower cost of funds into lower borrowing rates or capital rates because credit spreads widened. We entered a pandemic with this great deal of uncertainty. We don't know if the world's gonna recover at what pace, so it makes sense to pay more for credit risk. But agriculture had a less profound or pronounced version of that than commercial investments did. And if you're in a commercial real estate business right now, I think it's gonna be a tough year. I think it's gonna be a tough next year. <laughs> I'm not quite sure when it's going to not be a really tough year in that space. But in agriculture, we recovered reasonably quickly. So as has been noted, there's a, a liquidity um, kind of crunch going on right now in the sector, but it's really not a solvency issue yet. Um, we're getting a couple of questions in real time too about prognosticating about um, higher inflation and what that might do to agriculture. I suspect as the implied follow-up, uh, I just spent the morning on a different set of webinars with Global Ag Investment. And the idea is that agriculture has such a strong correlation with inflation that if we do get higher rates, if we do get to the point as you know, part of the conversation from last week's um, uh, Fed was that we print a lot of money. We may need to be more aggressive about inflation management, but productivity has not come back. So we may have to cut a little further before we increase. I don't predict that we're going to get really high inflation. That's unexpected. And I don't think we're going to get very high rates very soon. But if we do, it's actually not that bad for agriculture because the conditions under which that would have to happen uh, may create relatively more stress for other parts of the sector, frankly. So, um, so moving to the last of our kind of thought ideas, and then we'll get to more content. A way of thinking about it is think about the earnings you can get, and I'll use cash rent as a proxy here, divided by discount rate. And the discount rate reflects both the cost of capital and the prospects for growth in the earnings rate. Uh, so, um, Again, just think of an example, 225 cash rent. If your real 10-year um, uh, or discount rate, rather than the 10-year rate, I want that to be thought of as the discount rate. If the, if the discount rate were 3%, which again reflects all of the risk, not just can't tie it directly to a treasury, then the capitalized value would be 7,500 for that. Or another way to think about it is if you didn't know it was agriculture and we're just bidding for streams of future income, that would be a rational starting value. So cash rents in Illinois, um, again, that last number is, uh, should be 222 actually, um, but really stable the last few years have kind of grown, um, but we have to think about balancing out the next set of ideas. Overlay that with land value, and we'll do it a little more broadly here in a minute, but did they move relatively in lockstep and why are they getting, even though the scales are different, why do they look like they're converging using this scale? And the reason is because we had uh, discount rates that were dropping. So even with stable interest or stable cash rents, we could have um, stable or growing land values. Um, and Gary, anything to add on this too? I don't. Don't let me just do all the talking here. No, and again, we're we're seeing that if anything, those things. And remember, we've had stable cash rents, and what we're going to show in the next slide is that we have had our discount factors, however you measure it, coming down over time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we're we're th those fact the factor that our discount factors are going down 
are just as important for prop, for our, our, our farmland market, particularly given that you're looking at an asset that has that, that isn't concerned about occupancy That's or right. or, or, uh, or or a lot of other things. It's a relatively safe real asset so yeah that's a that's a really good point we um have heard this and lots of people made the point it's the only asset class the only real asset class whose occupancy rate is always effectively 100 percent um so this this slide um just shows kind of a comparison of what a theoretical value would be if you kept applying that and again we're not suggesting that people do we're suggesting that people continually revise their understanding about uh uh, the relationship between the long-term future income and the long-term cost of controlling the asset. And so in the 1980s, we had a period of time where we had a radical. So again, the scale may belie this a little bit. In the 80s, though, we ended up with a 25 to 50% land value reduction uh, kind of in a four or five year period. The farmland values that were actually observed were substantially above the level that the income could actually support. Again, there are lots of good explanations for that. We have, you know, good history understanding at this point. But generally, except for that period of time, we've not experienced a moment when the blue line, the actual prices, were above what the income from the asset could support. Now, move to 2010 and think about this. It's kind of an era where we didn't have farmland prices react to changes in income as though the income was permanent or as though the cap rate was always going to be that low. Instead, we got a much more muted response in farmland prices. And we probably have what I would say is a very rational market. No one would think that, you know, uh, 200 bushel corn ground is worth 20,000 or $23,000 in Illinois. But if you were to just repeat forever, the experience we have now, that's what a, you know, agnostic financial model might suggest you'd be willing to pay for it. Or if you were buying, you know, a startup tech company, this is the kind of uh, explanation that is the other side of the same coin. Why would you pay what you should pay for Tesla? Because the possibility either of massively growing income through time or continued reductions in cap rates makes sense. So now to the real, the real numbers. Uh, this slide is for the Midwest and shows, um, and it's a fairly carefully constructed idea. Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, uh, Missouri, the, you know, kind of the Corn Belt behaves very similarly. So the blue Illinois, red Iowa, and black Indiana lines move in lockstep, but are differentiated basically by the difference in productivity on average you would get if you moved across those states. So uh, Iowa has a little uh, higher ups when it goes up, a little more downs when it goes downs. I think there are good explanations for that. Um, Illinois, you know, very high production state as well, and Indiana tends to be close, but you know, a bit lower. And again, if you just applied that same idea, we just took the rent that you could achieve or the income numbers you got through time and divided in each case those by the, uh, we use a 10-year uh, uh, treasury interest rate as the um, proxy, not because we think that's directly the cost of capital, but because the credit spread to about that duration on the, year, on the yield curve seems fairly constant for agriculture. If you were to do that, you get the dotted lines. And it's the same as our theoretical one before. In the 80s, uh, we get uh, an answer that is farmland values just weren't, just weren't supportable. They just really weren't supportable. You had to have something monumental happen for that to work. And then from 2000 on, what we get is people don't believe that the current income and cap rate numbers are permanent and makes uh, the expectation that income for the long run divided by costs of owning that asset for the long run have resulted in fairly stable uh, asset values. And another question, and again, we'll just kind of do this one um, uh, on the fly here. Uh, Fed supply of dollars has gone up. Interest rates uh, have gone down as a result of that and many other things. If this is a correct interpretation uh, for farms looking to make investments, do you suggest safer investments during the recession of COVID, facilities, equipment, and so on? Um, and the, the answer to that is actually pretty complicated. You'd have to make an argument that the impact on agriculture has been greater from this recession than it is on the other assets for that to actually be a complete logic in my mind. 
And there is also some other things we haven't talked about, but ag markets are incredibly thin. It's hard to buy and sell farmland. So adjusting your portfolio at the margin by selling an acre is difficult or buying an acre is difficult. And safer investments, I am I would struggle to find a safer investment actually than farmland over a longer period of time. Uh, another really important question is how are we thinking about the income because property taxes in certain states, Nebraska had an episode of uh, increases that were high. Minnesota has prospects perhaps, Indian, Illinois is gonna have kind of a predictable pattern going forward. Um, Iowa and Indiana, perhaps a little bit lower per CSR point, but in the same general direction. We think of the income as net of taxes. So you think of it as rent minus taxes plus capital gain. And if that measure of income is correctly uh, accounted for, then taxes are already re removed before you make this calculation. The same way it would be if um, if our you know personal property taxes go up, what's the impact on our residences? If our income taxes go up, what's the remainder of the income you get? If you start with that remainder as the major of income and discount it, that's that's the version of this model that we're using. So, But yeah, property taxes are a great concern to agriculture right now because um, bluntly or maybe editorially, it looks like uh, an you know, a big store of value that's easy to tax because it's hard to find enough people to object to it. So you do get fairly heavy reliance on real asset values when you're putting together property tax systems. Can't move. <laughs> it's difficult to, It's you can't take your farmland and move it out to a different state. That's a good point, so. Uh, so um, thinking through some of the big issues here, and in particular, the first one, capitalized values compared to actual prices and what would affect either of those? What would affect our actual prices or our understanding about future income? The 80s were about the only period in history when we really had a divergence between those two, but that divergence generally does signal something. In the 80s, I would argue it was also heavily facilitated by lending programs that don't exist now. Farm credit had uh, kind of average cost funding models and we really were kind of projecting incomes and capital gains rates to only go up, you know, and anytime you think you, you know, if there's only one direction an economic asset can move, you're probably going to be wrong half the time. Uh, another point is that when they do differ, it's, it's a much greater concern if asset values are higher than the implied values. If it's the other way around, you have some runway on both variables or you have the ability to be wrong in both cases and not necessarily suffer the same. But when um, you have overvalued prices relative to what I would call fundamentals, um, two, two different changes in both values can cause problems. So, uh, the next point is a little bit more subtle. Um, while I think you might hear in my tone that the current values seem very rational to me, I would also say the leverage in that system where the tension on the rubber bands is greater than it has been. Uh, if incomes go down 10% and cost of capital goes down by 10% of its value, you get no change in asset value. If they go down 20%, you get no change in the value still. The problem, of course, is that the um, leverage on that is a big deal because 10% down to 9% is a 10% change in its level from a half percent back up to 1% is a 100% change in its level. So we have a little bit more built in um, what we would think of as um, gearing or leverage in just the, the changes in the denominator in particular. Uh, the next point, alternative investments have um, maintained their credit spreads a little wider for a little longer than farmland has. Uh, and the volatility, you know, every day on the way home, I, I, my radio in my truck happens to give me a feed that shows the S&P and I, you know, half the days I just look at it and go, I wonder what happened today that caused 500 points up or 500 points down. And you get home and read that nothing happened today. It just went up 500 or down. Or, so have a really fun former uh, grad student uh, who sent a tweet one day that said, what do you think is going to happen to the stock market today? Up 500, down 500, or both? <laughs> so I think alternative investments have maintained, despite the performance, 
some concern about the volatility going forward and and if we have a major second wave or a major uh, world crash in some other relationship or don't find a way to get back to uh, more normal distribution channels of certain uh, food and labor market um, outcomes that it could be we could go through a second uh, major readjustment uh, one that I like is if you ask me what asset I'd rather own I have a hard time coming up with an answer and because it's a thin market and there are a lot of you know neighbors who can when you do see assets come to market quite often it's a it's a uh, chance that you may not get again. So we do see people uh, having consumptive purchase kind of activities as well. Um, and at the same time, there's such broad new interest by everybody. I, I can't uh, remember a time when I've gotten as many inquiries from people outside of traditional asset um, investment space. Institutional markets are going strong. Retail markets seem like they're trying to find a toehold into the asset class, and yet it's difficult to find traditional deal flow. Finally, um, uncertainty about future income seems to have been buffeted by uh, government policy responses, and there are really good questions about whether or not that will continue. But I think what is clear is that the, the interruptions were not basic normal production activities. These were interruptions in trade, government policies, uh, pandemic, things that, wouldn't have been normal. So we have historically always taken the position as a government and society. Then when a, a broadly distributed bad thing happens, we look for a potential short term uh, uh, bridges uh, using the ability to tax and redistribute. So I think we will see some form of government programs continue for agriculture for as long as we have both people and food but the form of those may change and uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty about it. The final slide I wanna show is just uh, something from a different source altogether. As I said, we, this wasn't gonna be a surprise, but NACREF has about 12 billion invested, it's still just utterly rounding error compared to the total amount of farmland in the US, but it's all accounted for on exactly the same basis and the same rules for keeping track of income and, and, and actual external appraisal and so on. And what it says that's confirming to me is if you look in the Midwest where we've been talking, the USDA numbers were about right. The, the total income, uh, total return, I should say, over the last uh, four quarters total is about 4%, which I think looks relatively attractive to investors, frankly, and whether the investors are the neighbor's farm or uh, an institutional buyer. So we'll end with that as our uh, prepared comments and ask the final poll question. What do you think is going to happen to farmland prices in the next year? Increase? Increase a little? Stay within 5% plus or minus of today? Decline by 5 to 10% or decline by more than 10%? So as you answer that, um, it's interest rates, right? Other things that are yeah. that, that are important in this market today. And yeah, it's um it, it, the, the idea that the saying, may you live in interesting times, uh, was originally a curse has never been more <laughs> true than now, I guess. We have incredibly <laughs> cursed or interesting times that we're all living through, and we, we understand that that's added to the stress of doing even the simplest of things. So. Stay within a 51% of you stay, say, stay roughly the same. So that's where we're at here. Um, and? Let me get to our next slide here. It is indeed where we are. We've got some upcoming webinars, by the way, Gary. Uh, and you'll be in, I think, most or all of them, if I remember correctly, Friday this week, that is. I will be talking about where we are financially on Illinois farms. That'll be a lot of FBFM uh, with Brad Zwilling and, of course, with you. And Nick Paulson will join us as well. Should be an interesting one. Folks are already signed up if you're here. Uh, you're already signed up for it, so you should get another email uh, uh, from the Farm Doc team that'll let you in on that one. And then a week from this Friday, as uh, Gary alluded to early on, there will be some results from the Illinois uh, Society as it relates to farmland prices, and we'll go back through what those numbers uh, look like. We would like to take some time today and go ahead and write questions down if you've got them at this point, we'll get those answered as well. To thank our Farm Doc sponsors, they include, of course, the TIAA Center for Farmland Research, 
If you've not been there, that's right here on the Urbana-Champaign campus. Bruce is the director, Sherrick, and uh, it's easy to get to, farmland.illinois.edu. Uh, farmland, all one word, .illinois.edu. Compere Financial also helping today along with Farm Credit Illinois, Growmark, FS, uh, and the Illinois Corn Growers Association. So our thanks to them uh, for helping out and making sure that these webinars are available for you to participate in. And also thanks uh, to you all for, for joining us today. Well, I haven't looked again to see, but I think there are probably at least a couple of questions, Gary and Bruce, that we should get started with. What do you see to begin with? Yeah, yeah. so a question, um, what about deal flow tied to demographics in particular fractional shares? So uh, grandpa gave it to my dad who shared it with his brothers and three sisters who gave it to me and I'm in a family of six. So now we have 28 fractional owners of the farm. Does that lead to us selling it, disposing of it differently? What are the institutional features that um, might solve that going forward. And I would say that there is a bit of a um, difference in the way people view their investment. And I heard somebody um, describe it once. It may have been Paul Pittman. Uh, if you can't remember having Thanksgiving dinner at your grandma's table, you may not think of the farm as home. Yeah, something like that. And I think as you get to the more fractionally owned uh, aspects of it, people do begin to view it just like, uh, well, am I getting my dividend payment or I mean rental check? Yep. And it does get to that point. Um, but we've never really, um, it's not as much of an accelerated demographic change as one might think. We hear all the time that the average age of the farmer is 65 or 66 and getting older, but we've all been getting older at one year per year for a really long time. And the operators are not necessarily getting older as fast as the owners are, because as operations get a little larger, you bring in, you know, a son, daughter, neighbor. And it's never been the case that that's led to massive turnover. Um, people do also confuse one of the total surveys, T-O-T-A-L, total, I forget the acronym, but it's land ownership. Um, and transferring into a trust or transferring it uh, to your heirs does count as a transfer that's separate than arm's length. Arm's length um, means that anybody could have bought it and somebody other than somebody who could have been expected to get a preferential treatment bought it. That hardly ever gets above about one and a half percent per year. So that means we may be on average holding farmland in families for 50 to 75 years. Uh, thin markets too, thank you for that question. A thin market is just a very small fraction that turns over with high transaction or friction costs. And again, sales per year, um, we get the, um, what well, we look at, I wouldn't say we get, we don't own and can't redistribute, but because the, uh, the mechanism for calculating and verifying assessed values for farmland in, in Illinois required Department of Revenue data, we do get to um, accurately see how many acres sell in a year and as classified between family members or related parties or independently, and it really is incredibly thin, less than one and a half percent of the total land. Yeah. And that hasn't been changing much over time? That has not ever changed. The, in the last 30 years, that's been roughly the answer. And even if we think that institutions are buying farmland, it's such a small share that trades every year that it would be very long time to... Right. So an easy way to think about that, think about, suppose there's, there's roughly three trillion of assets uh, in the ag sector. Um, and if you had, even if we even if we were wrong, we know how much uh, farmland is held in NACREF. It's about 12 billion publicly reported. We know how many dollars are in publicly traded firms. Even if we're wrong by a factor of two, it's less than one half of 1%. So held by institutions. Now, the, 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 that's changing. That part may be accelerating, <clears throat> but when you go from zero to a half percent, I don't even know how to think about the percentage change. So I don't think it's a massive quantity. It's just increasing fast and in somewhat useful way. So what will CRP prices be doing in the next five to 10 years? We don't know. So. <laughs> but it depends on government policy, obviously. Probably depends somewhat on the election this year. By the way, we've had this question before, what will the election do to farmland prices? My answer is 
probably nothing for until some we see something done by the individual in office that's unexpected, right? I, I agree. I think um, it's there are like um, expectation changes when political parties change, and if the Senate stays Republican and the House is Democrat, I'm not sure that whether the president is Democrat or Republican means that you'll have a, a clear line of sight to massive policy change. The question, one, can you explain one more time why you use a 10-year treasury in your simple capitalization form uh, rather than the five or the 30-year? Uh, yeah, one, because it's kind of convention and most deeply traded and becomes a really good index for the average cost of funding with something with more than, a, say, a seven-year duration. Uh, banks use it as an index, and we're not suggesting that it's the right number. We're saying that the um, credit spread, if you will, or the relative credit risk to about that point on the yield curve works about as well as any. If we had drawn those maps the, the, with the five-year or the 30-year, you would have seen a similar pattern, but not nearly as much congruence between the implied and the actual for the long, long periods of time between the 80s and the early 2000s. So as an empirical device too, it's handy because we don't have to explicitly break out the differentials for credit risk. Long-term leases for solar farms scare many because of potential long -term returns. Do you feel the lease rates start at a fair rate? Uh, so I've I have only looked at a couple, and you know they they can look very attractive actually in terms of the payments for offtake and decommissioning questions are complicated and scary. Um, it's had the same thing with wind. It does. The only thing I'll say in addition to that is it does appear that when you sell a tract with some renewable energy generator on it, the discount rate you apply to that portion of the income is substantially higher than the discount rate you have to apply to the income from the agricultural component of the income. Um, I'm, I, we have some you know, incredibly well-informed folks. Uh, Dave Klein out at First Mid seems to know more about this than I ever will. And he has to kind of explain things to me a lot. And I think um, the, the long-term leases for energy makes sense. I just don't have as much information in them as I wish I did. Yeah, unlike wind, it's pretty easy to take down a solar. <laughs> it is, and the um, mechanisms for paying for generation um, uh, seem to be coming more what I would consider um, sophisticated and grown up. In the in the long run, what role does demand for other uses, urban growth, hunting, water, carbon sequestration play play in comparison to interest rate capitalization? and or the farm economy. I have a real uh, solid you know, personal view on that, and it's that the form of the income does change the level of interest rate that you use to discount it, but all of these are just returns to agriculture. So carbon, I think, yeah, my personal view is that eventually this becomes a very positive argument for agriculture. It, to me, is the only place you can sequester large scale, large quantities of CO2 is by putting organic matter back in the soil, which farmers also want. Owners want, renters want, everybody wants. Um, and so instead of arguing that agriculture is the problem, it after people study it for a while, they actually generally come around to believing that it's one of the only possible solutions instead. So I think figuring out how we do that is a long-term game. Figuring out how that to, to price it is a complicated and long-term question uh, for environmental attributes more broadly than just carbon. Uh, but I think it's just another income stream in the long run. Yeah, the other thing about urban growth, that was a big impact in the early 2000s, mid-2000s. I don't know if we can anticipate uh, large urban growth in the foreseeable future. What would you say? I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, the, the Will Rogers quote, I heard it. Uh, in each of the sessions this morning at the Global Ag Conference, you know, buy land, they ain't making no more of it or something like that. I think it's the general nature of the Will Rogers quote. But on a world basis, arable land is continuing to grow. So it does change the relative quantity, and it doesn't change it so rapidly that we have shortages of places in the world to grow things. But it does impact, and eventually, you know, it does encroach. But you know, the most desirable lots aren't necessarily always the 
best farmland, despite the fact that we have in Illinois, nothing but great farmland where there are a lot of cities. So if they grow, they naturally take up farmland. But I, I don't think that's going to be a massive, you know, singular influence on either. So why not weaker economics? No, tr And I'm assuming if we Biden wins, no Trump payments with Biden administration. I'm not sure I would make that assumption. Um, the way the way ad hoc or MFP, CFAP, and it go back to the 1990s, we or late 1990s, we had additional payments then. They eventually got built into the safety net. So there's a lot of observers that think that that will be what happens this time around. I'm not sure. I, <laughs> I, my, my coin flip is as good as yours, but I think it's difficult to say that government support has been you know, an on off switch based on the administration. If you, you know, just empirically look through time through both government, Democrat and Republican presidencies, uh, that doesn't, that's never the determining factor on the quantity of support for agriculture. So understanding, this is a good comment. Understand, or one that I like. Understanding that I remember the 80s is a risk, but to the ag doesn't have occupancy problem. At some point, the occupancy requires a major drop in rent if the expectations of return, government support, and export shift. You know, I do not, Bruce can answer this in his way. I don't dis, dis, disagree with you, but here's here's two things I, I will, will say. We've been saying returns, just, I have been saying returns justify a drop in cash rents and it hasn't happened. I'm not sure that government support goes away anytime soon. So, and then we've always thought that interest rates are going to rise and they haven't yet. In fact, they went down more this year. Now, Paul is talking negative interest rates. Uh, uh, negative interest rates plus positive inflation plus managed inflation. So that's, I think that is a great question. And it, it in summary is worked out in markets and markets have everybody making their belief known about their estimated likelihood of each of those effects. Are we ever going to get back our export markets? I think not. I don't think you ever get back 100% of what you blow up because of the long term. But do we get other export outlets perhaps as a result? Yes. I think the, the biggest question in my mind, all of those points were correct. I still think the biggest question in my mind is long-term demand for calories, long-term consumable incomes around the world. Um, in the US, if we gave everybody another dollar tomorrow, which we might, <laughs> we do government <laughs> programs like that all the time. We don't really change what we eat that much, but there are big parts of the world that are coming out of you know, highly vegetable diets to put more higher quality proteins in them, which really multiplies up the demand for grains if you're gonna feed them to animals first. Um, and so I think that's the great question. The 80s were just a different world because it was fueled by lending practices that don't exist now. We had a much less well-developed export-import uh, system on a world basis. So a grain embargo could have a much more major impact than a single country tariff change would have now. And so relative to history, I think there have been some dilutions in the degree of each of those individual impacts. Um, but your but the point, whoever can also remember the 80s um, shouldn't forget the 80s, and those who can't should go meet somebody who can remember the 80s. Um, no, that's a very good point. And, and just, I, I do think there is a possibility of cash rents declining, particularly if we don't have any more federal aid payments, mm -hmm. and it's anybody's guess. You probably won't see it until you don't see the federal aid, right? No, I think that's right. So uh, if federal support for agriculture continues to be, you know, essentially target uh, level of income that prevents broad disruption minus the current actual income mm -hmm. and the difference is federal, then I think you get um, some stability going forward. What is the likelihood of changes in 1031 or step up basis values negatively impacting farmland values going Wow, forward? that's a that's a tough one. A few years ago, or two years ago, I guess it was now, when um, proposals for eliminating 1031 were floated, there was a massive response by industry. And people think of 1031 as largely being tied to agriculture, and it's not. It's a section of the tax code that applies to upgrading your jet airplane or moving your office building or uh, some other um, um, 
way of exchanging an asset for a like kind one that might represent the ability to continue to grow. Good, good point, uh, Jim. Remind us that 1031 may be vernacular or code that not everybody under, fully understands, and I won't get the details right, but the point is if you own something and sell it, generally you have to pay capital gains. But if you use that to, say, grow into a new factory, we didn't really want you to, to experience capital gains if you're still doing the same thing with the same capital. So 1031 is the idea that you can exchange, you know, sell one farm but buy another farm. If you're being encroached on by a subdivision and you sell it and buy a different farm, you really haven't changed what you're doing with that capital. So we don't impose capital gains taxes as long as you reinvest in a like kind. It's called like kind exchange. Um, but again, it's a very broadly written category and farmland is not the major user of it. It's a uh, corporately used rule. And so the, um, I guess the political uh, will to fight that change was pretty strong. It could still happen and ag could be in fact carved out and made into a specific thing. Anytime you change the tax rate, you have a direct influence on the relative value. So if you make uh, sales harder, a good reason to own farmland for a long time and one of the historic explanations for thin markets was it's a great asset to die with. It's a great asset to get a uh, big step up in basis. Uh, it's a great asset to perhaps um, provide a safety net for your kids and their kids in a long-term, you know, very stable store of, you know, it's it's black gold in many ways. So. so if global acres become more efficient at grain production, does that shift investor interest towards U.S. acreage and permanent planting type crops. that's a really sophisticated question and it's it's been a really important question for a long time we've seen productivity gains in other parts of the world begin to catch up with the u.s and so one potential logical consequence of that is u.s ag uh, land values don't increase as much with productivity as would be the case in other parts of the world but what that misses at uh, a level of complete analysis is that the demand is also growing and the question is whether demand grows faster than total productivity and then relative productivity and distance you have to ship it become a cost. There's a, there's a great um, graphic that I can't do justice by describing, but if you look at the world transportation flows where everything is produced and where everything is consumed, it's become a really integrated spider web of everything. And so the same sort of thing could be thought of if we could, we, if we you know, if we built TVs in the U.S., a 30-inch TV might cost $10,000 or something. So we don't want to really do that. But if we become relatively more efficient at producing parts for iPhones that we ship to China and then they ship the completed phone back, the question of this distributed gain in productivity gets sorted out in relative prices. And what's happened is that the U.S.'s relative efficiency, including transportation costs and alternative uses, has been shown to be pretty good. I... I think there are parts of the world that will be winners. There may be some South American, you know, Chile, Argentina are interesting somehow, but government risk to me is high. There'll be parts of the US that will suffer. We'll continue to grow more and more of the tree nuts in the Western part of the US and California, Arizona. The demand for those on a world basis seems to be growing faster than productivity enhances, which shrink that from you know places that you can also grow nuts. So I, I think it's, it's, it's an accurate, assessment of the possibility, but I think the relative size of the effects is going to be fairly small. What sets asset farmland values, thinking back to 23,000 in thin markets? Uh, you know what? It's as everything else, a willing buyer, a willing seller, and they have to agree on it, and that's what sets the, the actual value of farmland. So if you had, what would you say, tell a person to begin looking at, at farmland? Um, uh, I don't have a favorite location to buy if you're looking for information or the yeah, actual farm. Informa land. Information on farmland. Uh, well, clearly FarmDoc. Yeah, there we <laughs> All go. All good sources of information should start with FarmDoc. Now, there are um, uh, some good resources that you can at least truly actually can begin linking at FarmDoc and moving out, but it's a it's an asset class that is fun to learn about as well. You know, broadly reading about it, I don't think you're going to find that that was a boring event. Um, and then university folks tend to be pretty approachable and enjoy 
talking through this with with investment groups at almost any point in time. So when do, uh, we got you keep asking questions, we got to end here. But when do you think we reach peak corn and beans with trends around electric vehicles, alternative proteins, and shifts away from animal ag? Due to environmental impacts, and I, we will. I will give you my opinion. Bruce will give you. A, I think we the the peak ethanol use. We may be there. We may be there. Although it may be time for the oil industry and the ag industry to get together and make one last push. And I am not as sure as everybody else that uh, there's a shift away from animal proteins. And just just as a case in point, there are a number of milk substitutes, and milk dairy demand still is strong. That it will take some um, away, but uh, there's still a growing. I, I don't think you reach peak corn and soybeans. There's a lot of people in this world that can transform and eat more protein. I, I agree, and again, I think this will be our last question. <clears throat> Alternative proteins mean different things in different parts of the world. Uh, so in the U.S., we think of it as a fairly privileged debate, actually, about do we want to eat something because we don't want to have to slaughter an animal or have environmental views that are different. But most of the world, the demand for protein is to feed to an animal first. Uh, alternative proteins are still reasonably expensive in some sense and still have to be fed with things you grew. So to, to build a, a veggie burger, you still had to grow something. And the nutritional differences are not zero between animal proteins and plant proteins, um, but we're working that out and we'll work it out for a long time. And if alternative proteins grow, it's because they're more efficient or more affordable relative to demands for that. And on a world basis, it's not clear to me that that's good or bad for agriculture. The environmental concerns in the Midwest, latter part of the question, um, I again, almost always go back to, I, every time I make a presentation, somebody either applauds or wants to beat me up for, you know, saying that it's really the market's job to work that out and the market includes policy around it. But um, I don't think that the agriculture is the culprit that it was in the headlines for 10 years and will become part of the solution. So being able to help with population uh, or with climate change under the two basic facts that there will be more people and they will continue to eat means that the version of agriculture that sequesters carbon is probably uh, the one that will emerge, and that's probably good for land values. On and farm note. building sites, yes, they are going down in value. Hello, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to hear from you. Let's turn it over. Todd, it's your, take it away. Yeah, on that note, uh, we'll wrap things up for the day. Thank you to Gary Schnitke and Bruce Sherrick, both ag economists here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois, uh, for being our presenters in this Farm Doc Daily webinar. Don't forget that we have more webinars coming up this Friday and the following one. We'll talk about uh, where uh, are we at uh, on, financially that is, on Illinois farms, and then we'll come back to farmland and values and prices on the following Friday, September the 4th. You're already signed up for both of those, but uh, share that out with your friends and neighbors. September if you think 4th, but Todd, well. they have to sign up for the September 4th one. Oh, it's not part of the same series? Oh, no. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll make sure that then you'll go back. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to go to the Farm Doc Daily website, look for webinars, and make sure you sign up for that one. Outlook for farmland prices and rents. Uh, that comes from the Illinois Society of Professional. Oh, help me out, Gary. I don't recall. Illinois it. Society of Professional Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. Now, there you go. So get yourself signed up for that one as well. Also, thanks to Jim Boltz, who's our direct technical director today. Uh, on behalf of the whole team here at the University of Illinois, we thank you too for joining us on U of I Extensions. Todd Gleason, wishing you a great day.